My name is Karen Hill. I'm with the Canadian Association of Social Workers. And this morning, um, I'm interviewing Mr. J.A. Carmichael at his home at 345 Oxford Street in Winnipeg. Uh, this is the Oral History of Social Work in Canada project. And the date is uh, the 23rd of January. Uh, Mr. Carmichael, I'm wondering if we can begin this morning by you telling us where you were born and when and uh, a little bit about your early life. Yes, I was born originally uh, on a farm in the Nipawa area back in 1916. And uh, I went to high school in Nipawa following a early education in a one-room school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was followed by a year of normal school training as a teacher. And uh, I was a teacher from then on until the war broke up. You were a teacher in Manitoba during the Depression. Uh, that must yes. have been quite an experience. Well, it was, uh, it's relative. Everybody was in the same position, and so you didn't think there was anything different about it until you look back uh, in those days. Actually, everybody was in the same boat, so I uh, uh, really enjoyed it. <laughs> you enjoyed it. I, uh, were you paid during the time you were de doing your teaching? Oh, yes. Uh, I uh, had my salary raised the second year I was teaching from $450 a year to $500 a year. So I got into the tax bracket. <laughs> <laughs> and became susceptible to more taxes. Yes. <laughs> uh, I understand that some teachers during the Depression in Manitoba weren't paid uh, much, if at all. And that no, this was more true in Saskatchewan, but there were a few cases in Manitoba. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were a teacher during those years uh, until the war broke out. What happened then in 1939 or so? Well, um, I think the uh, uh, government of our day at that point uh, were very conscious of the backlog of young people unemployed in these different uh, communities. and. Uh, they gave teachers a special training in setting up youth centers, which uh, were uh, sort of recreational centers of um, sports, uh, gymnastics, uh, drama, uh, etc., which involved a great number of young people. In one district, for example, uh, uh, it was a four-room school, so you can see the size of the people, but the size of the uh, community. Uh, we had 95 young people enrolled in the youth center, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a very good time. We met two evenings a week, and it sort of balanced off into a lot of community effects in the church, and the skating rink was revived, and the curling rink, and, and uh, we were to put on concerts and raise money to do other things. And it uh, sort of livened up the whole community. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you mentioned that the government was encouraging that kind of thing. Was that the provincial government? Yes. And how were they involved in, in encouraging you to set up these youth centers? Well, they gave you credit towards uh, improving your standard, your certificate standing in uh, teacher training, your teacher certificate mm -hmm. uh, through summer school courses, and uh, particularly out at Gimli, Manitoba where they give summer school courses and, and uh, youth center leadership courses. So this was a chance for you to, uh, uh, to do some what's now called community organizing. Yes. Did you have special training for it to teach you how to do that? Yes. And that, how did that come about? Where, where did you get that education, that training? Well, that was that? on these courses during the summer. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, you got credit toward your teaching certificate that raised your so that you're a double benefit. <laughs> Benefits for many people, and yeah. for yourself, and, and but the communities mm -hmm. that you worked in. And then, uh, as a result of this, uh, this led to uh, uh, an opportunity to join the YMCA War Services in the Air Force. And what was that? Well, this meant that you, uh, at the beginning of the war, there was a lot of things that needed to be done that uh, there was nobody to do them. Um, there was no sports people, there was no recreation people, and very often there was no padre, so uh, very often you found yourself doing all three, and uh, your stations to open, 
across the prairies here for the Commonwealth. So you had these young airmen from all the Commonwealth countries as well as uh, from the states who were not in the war at that point. These young people were desperately lonely. And you had the young people from Florida coming up to January weather in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, there was a lot of adjustments to do and a lot of sudden changes for these young people. So, so for the, the uh, military people who were stationed at bases in Manitoba then, the YMCA had opened these uh, These auxiliary exil services, yes. And you became involved in that? Yes. After you, after you had stopped teaching? Yes. I and, see. And uh, so that for the first year of the war, this is what I was doing, and then I became air, an, an air crew recruit myself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm anxious to hear more about that. I, I'm wondering, were there social work services through the military at that time? No. Uh, before the war progressed very far, there started to be some so-called social work positions, but uh, they were not very well developed until near the end of the war. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. So in the, the, the voluntary sector, so to speak, filled that gap. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how you were involved in it. Mm -hmm. And then you, you uh, I won't say graduated, you changed and became, a, you were a navigator yes. in the RCAF, mm -hmm. and not? That must have been quite a switch. Well, it was interesting. Uh, uh, I joined the Air Force uh, to fly. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, we finished the navigation course, because I had been teaching, I was uh, assigned to be an instructor which I strongly objected to because I could teach any time I wanted to. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, I finally managed to get an overseas posting as a navigator. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. and what happened then? Well, we, uh, they were short of certain kinds of air crew, and, we, uh, and three of us were chosen to go directly to a squadron without any operational training, uh, which we had to pick up in a very short period of time on the squadron. And uh, we were assigned to um, uh, uh, Air Force Group 4, which was a special duties group, including the Dam Buster Squadron and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a very mixed crew from all over the Commonwealth. There was a crew of seven, but there was only one other Canadian. And, uh, an excellent crew, and uh, we made about seven operational trips, and uh, uh, we shot down, and we were prisoner of war for the balance of the war. <laughs> During the time you were a prisoner of war, in uh, you were in Germany yes. you, most most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, was there? <laughs> did you find any uh, any use for the training you'd had before in organizing groups and, and yes. training people? Well, you and found yourself doing much, much, many of the same sort of things that you were doing with the young people before the war and during the YMCA war services, um, setting up newspapers and correspondence that came from homes uh, mm -hmm. when the mail came through, um, organizing um, uh, study groups from the YMCA courses that were offered in the camp. Um, you could actually take a university course, but very few did because you thought you were going to be home next month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there was all kinds of entertainment to raise up, and there was uh, different uh, people, different countries that uh, want to improve their English, like the Polish squadrons, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, it was gardening, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and there was all kinds of escape activity too that you got involved in. And so there was plenty to do. The 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 escape activities are tunneling and that sort of thing. That was one of them. Yes. Mm -hmm. During, as you look back on it now, uh, do you see things from your early years that affected your later work uh, as a social worker? Well, um, I've, looking back, I find that uh, I actually was doing volunteer social work all the time, but I didn't take it as such. I didn't know 
there was a profession of social work at the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I returned to university afterwards, it's rather interesting, I went up to uh, see the head of the psychologist. I thought I wanted to be a psychologist, and I went up to see the head of the psychologist department at the university, and after talking with them, uh, Professor Carl Williams, who later on became a university professor down east, he says, you don't want to be a psychologist, you want to be a social worker. And I said, well, what's, what's that? And he says, go down and see Mr. Smith, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, head of the School of Social Work. Mm -hmm. So after talking with Dr. Smith, that's where I ended up. <laughs> what was it that you said, do you think, that made uh, Dr. Williams think you were going to be a social worker <coughs> instead of a psychologist? I, I think that uh, probably what attracted me most was the, uh, ac the action or the possibility of uh, being having a contact over a period of time with people that uh, you could uh, uh, assist in uh, using uh, opportunities in life better than they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rather than psychology, which was seen as a sort uh, of a one-time... Yeah, uh, sort of as a diagnostic uh, mm -hmm. procedure at that time. Mm -hmm. And I thought social workers could work very well with uh, psychologists. I preferred the other side of it rather than the psychologist side. Mm -hmm. What advice did Dr. Uh, Dr. Smith give you about uh, about your social work education? What did he suggest you should do? I don't really remember. Uh, I just remember that he was a good listener, and uh, and uh, the decision, decision when I uh, left his office was that I was going to be a social worker. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And did you, did you go to school full-time then, uh, when you finished your, uh, when you were released from the POW camp? Well, then my first, uh, I was with adult education at the university when I came out first with the uh, Citizens Forum program, I used to be on the CBC. And uh, I did that first and then took some, one of these special veterans courses that they were offering. Mm -hmm. uh, off season, rather, and uh, made up time that way. What was the Citizens Forum? It was a public relations, a public education uh, program where you organized uh, study groups throughout the province, and then you had a presentation on the CBC radio, mm -hmm. and that was the basis of the discussion. And uh, then the results of the discussion was sent in to me, and then I had to summarize them on a five to ten minute broadcast each week mm -hmm. and it was very exciting. And that would have put you in contact with uh, probably more of the province than you yes. had been before. It was a very difficult job because I had been prisoner of war and there was many issues in, uh, and, and going on in the public uh, uh, news that uh, I had been isolated from. Mm -hmm. and so it, uh, it was uh, a quick way to get back into civvies again. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds, too, as though, again, you were able to put your organizing ability to mm -hmm. use there. Yes, we uh, um, did a fair amount of traveling all over Manitoba and uh, tripled the number of, of um, study groups mm -hmm. uh, during the few months the first year. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you mentioned then that you took advantage of a, a program for veterans education, something in the off-season. Uh, could you explain that to me? Well, um, there were university courses for veterans offered starting in September, starting at Christmas, starting at Easter, so that you could get back into the September regular class the next year. I That's see. what I meant. I see, I see. And uh, so your education then... Uh, you received a Bachelor of Arts degree from, where yeah. did you go to school? <coughs> University of Winnipeg, yeah, or Manitoba. The University of Manitoba. And then did you go directly into uh, a professional social work program? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, a little concerned about that kind of training from the School of Social Work, which meant that uh, in one year, you became a social worker, you became a magician that was uh, had very high expectations of you, yeah. and you were supposed to be qualified to carry them out with one year's training. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was strongly advocating that uh, 
pass their social work you should be an undergraduate training so that you were exposed to it over a long period of time mm -hmm. such as education engineering medicine anything else and uh, uh, that took a while to come about too. I was wondering if at that time, 1948 or so, if there was a, a bachelor's pr level program in social work in, in Canada. Did that exist then? I don't think so. Not on the undergraduate level. Not that I remember now. Uh, I remember um, being um, on the CASW board and I, I remember a, an instance where we met with the uh, um, directors of the schools of social work at a meeting in Ottawa where uh, looking back we found that I remember that all the directors were very defensive of the <coughs> courses that they were offering mm -hmm. and <coughs> they were not um, <coughs> they were not very receptive to uh, the suggestion that they become undergraduate course. But well, why did they oppose the idea? Well, they thought that uh, I guess it was just change. Nobody likes change. And uh, however, before very long, that uh, they were receptive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I recall a meeting in Winnipeg here where I expressed my uh, uh, myself very much, and one of the professors here uh, sort of tore a strip off me, and and uh, I was supported by the deputy minister, Cale McKenzie, which made me feel there maybe was something to it. And uh, before very long, you know, when you talk very much, uh, you get put on a committee, and that's what happened. And you found yourself on the on a curriculum committee of the School of Social Work. Uh -huh, <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, w were you uh, involved in the uh, the bringing about of a bachelor's level program here then, uh, specifically? Indirectly, yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I um, I'm not fond of the limelight and. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, so I wasn't very outstanding on these uh, committees, uh, but other people were, mm, seemed to get the right people to get the right results. Mm -hmm. Anybody in particular that you have in mind as you say that, to people that perhaps uh, made no, an impression upon you? No, not uh, strongly. Uh, um, well, there was Sid McCartan and Kale McKenzie, and Dorothy McCartan and uh, Sheila Sinclair, Ellen Mann. Mm -hmm. um, these are all people that uh, I had Ellen's, uh, one of my casework instructors that's made a very deep impression during the years following. Uh, who was that? Helen Mann. Helen Mann, mm -hmm. yes. Uh -huh. um, to, to go back, uh, Van Ver to your own master's degree education. You you didn't get a master's degree here at the University of Manitoba. No, I um, uh, worked with the uh, Child Guidance Clinic <clears throat> as a visiting teacher, as they called them that time, and the qualifications were that you had to be a teacher and you had to be a social worker, which was a very rare combination. And uh, it was soon changed that uh, the social, the, the child guidance clinic was in its early phase at that time. I believe I was the first man to be hired, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, I think that I was able to help bring social work into the schools, mm -hmm. which was uh, not done very much up mm -hmm. to that point. What was the work of the child guidance clinic? Well, at that point, uh, it was helping. Yeah, well, as far as I was concerned, my philosophy was that here was an opportunity for uh, children to get an education, and if they uh, were not benefiting by it, why? Mm -hmm. And was it because you could help the family or the child or the teacher? Is what was it? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, first of all, uh, you, uh, I felt that uh, if I could complement what the teacher was doing. I understood having taught what they were up against. And uh, if they understood a bit more about the life of the individual child, which was one of the class of 40, it might help. It might give them more satisfaction in teaching, mm -hmm. make their teaching better. And by uh, working with the parents, 
they would appreciate the school side of it. And uh, by getting them to work together with a little help, uh, they could work it out themselves. Uh -huh. But because you weren't going to be there forever, they would have to work it out themselves. So part, only part of your role then was uh, to do formal teaching? I didn't do any teaching at all. Oh. It was straight to actually social work. I see. I and see. This became social work, and I became the supervisor of the school social workers before I left. And the child got spent. Yes, <laughs> yes. What was it like to be the only man in that, uh, in that setting? Uh, social work is often thought of as, quote, women's work, end quote. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, it was lots of fun. <laughs> um, no, it was very, it was very, it was very interesting. Uh, uh, being the only man, you got um, unusual calls where they felt uh, somebody felt that uh, perhaps a man was the was uh, better um, able to go in on a case than a woman, which uh, sometimes was true, sometimes it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, I remember one instance where we were having an awful time with the family. The mother was very hostile, and uh, the social worker had had an awful time. She'd been chased out with a butcher knife, and uh, with much trepidation, I made this visit. And uh, she happened to be having a lot of trouble with her washing machine that morning, and because I was able to get the washing machine going, I was quite acceptable and had no more trouble after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, many talented social yes. workers. <laughs> I can see the advantages there, indeed. Mm. Um, you, you didn't go to uh, the University of Manitoba for your, for your master's degree. Uh, uh, how did it happen that you went to McGill? Well, um, <clears throat> I... McGill offered the course, one of the few universities that did. <coughs> it uh, was a small school. It had a very good standing and uh, it was one that appealed to me. And um, there's another story there. there. There were mental health bursaries and in Manitoba uh, they uh, were reserved under the minister at that time for only medical people. They had doctors and nurses. Um, the uh, chief psychiatrist, Dr. Pincock, uh, and his brother, the superintendent of schools, another Dr. Pincock, they decided that I should go and have a test case <laughs> mm -hmm. with uh, the minister, and uh, it worked. And so that I was able to break the ice for other social workers to have mental health scholarships. Uh, I was also uh, accepted for a DVA uh, benefits too, and I also had a scholarship from Cleveland Foundation. So I was well away, and I had to make a decision as to which one to use. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought the mental health one would be more beneficial to more people. Mm -hmm. The Cleveland one, would that have required you to go to Cleveland no. to Case Western? No. That could have been used anywhere? Yeah. So it turned out that you did go to McGill and, and uh, received your master's degree yes, there. When was that that you were uh, uh, that in? It was 1950 51. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took the psychiatric sequence, which made a six day week. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting. Any memorable uh, uh, faculty members or other people that you met while you were at McGill? Yes, uh, Dorothy Freeman was one that was my field supervisor. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, she uh, undertook to uh, make a social worker out of me rather than a teacher. Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, she also uh, gave me cases in the, particularly the Verdun School Division, which had never had a social worker before. Mm -hmm. And uh, this got very demanding, and we had to put a limit on it. Very uh, demanding uh, uh, from a number of cases? Yes. Uh -huh. But uh, it was very good. What did Miss Freeman do that in, in order to make a, make you over from a teacher to a social worker? Well, she uh, pointed out in many ways uh, how that I was talking too much. I was teaching rather than doing casework, uh -huh. and uh, pointed out the benefits 
and the differences yes. between the two. Yes. And if I was going to be a social worker, this is what I should do. And see, uh, I thought that I could do it very well. And uh, so she went after me, and she was, uh, she was a tough instructor, but mm -hmm. very good. She, she encouraged you mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. put you on your way. That's to right. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, during the time, well, I'm not sure when it was uh, in the sequence of your, of your education, but the, the Winnipeg, Winnipeg flood occurred uh, <laughs> during 1950, I guess it was. Yes, that was during my first year uh, in school social work, and uh, that closed the school, so I had nothing to do. That's not a social work story, though. <laughs> <laughs> The the uh, the Winnipeg flood is one of the one of the, the, the sort of natural disasters and one of the big crises that uh, people in Canada have had to deal mm -hmm. with. Um, I would find it quite interesting to see how you, who were on your way to becoming a social worker, mm -hmm. were involved in that. Uh, well, I wasn't involved in much of the social work aspects of it. I sort of fell in by accident into assessing flood damage and um, then having to put a price tag on the damage afterwards, uh, not being, not knowing anything about uh, building. I scarcely knew the difference between a rafter and a beam. <laughs> and uh, so I had to just follow blindly a formula, something like learning to be a navigator in the Air Force. You didn't have time to learn why you did things. It's like learning to drive a car, you don't know the machine that uh, makes the car go. Uh, you know that if you change the gears and so on, you, it goes. Mm -hmm. And so as a navigator, that's all about, about all the time you had to learn too. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> here you were again in the middle of a flood, having to do things that had to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was following uh, uh, a schedule, a formula, mm -hmm. and working with um, uh, tried and true realtors and construction people who were using their experience in the 30s and the depression of um, repairing and costing uh, these homes. So um, my figures were coming out ridiculously high uh, according to in relation to the others, and I thought, well, I guess I've come to the end of my ability. And however, when they went out to the contractors, the contractor came back with my figures. Prices had gone up, inflation had started. <laughs> and uh, so, as a result of this, I was made a supervisor, and it was very embarrassing. <laughs> Were there things about, the, about that? Um uh, that job that um, had an effect on what you did later on? Uh, well, you saw a lot of heartbreak there, particularly of the older people that uh, had lost everything in the flood, uh, their furniture, their souvenirs, their things that they lived with, their lying on the floor and mud. And uh, how are you going to get compensation? How could you replace this for them in any way at all? Mm -hmm. And so this led you to informally go outside of what you were doing to put them in touch with uh, services and organizations that would help them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I guess that was my social work coming out again. <laughs> <laughs> coming through, yes, yes. When, when you finished at McGill, uh, what happened then? Well, I came back to the Child Guidance Clinic and uh, because I had an MSW, uh, I was automatically made head of the department, which again was a bit embarrassing because um, when I was doing my field work as a, super, as a student there, one of the staff uh, had been my field work instructor. Mm -hmm. And here I was back as a point of her supervisor, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was very difficult, but however, we worked it out. And, were there many uh, social workers, uh, MSWs, uh, in Manitoba at that time? Yeah, I believe I was the sixth one. Yeah. <laughs> there weren't, weren't very many. Yeah. And it was, uh, well, there weren't very many social workers, period. There were 
or more, far more BSWs, but there are not very many MSWs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who some of the others were, the, the other MSWs? Oh, well, you come back again to uh, Kale McKenzie. Some of the leading social workers were not masters people, mm -hmm. and masters didn't mean that much, mm -hmm. really. Who were but, some of the others then? Well, it was Sid and Dorothy McCartan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure of who the other people were. Uh, some of the faculty at the school, I suppose, uh, uh, were MSWs. Um, some of them became faculty members. Uh, Mary Easterbrook, Sheila Sinclair, mm -hmm. um, Audrey Pritkinson. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get that name. Audrey Pritkinson. Um, mm -hmm. oh, there are many others. Uh, mm -hmm. My memory doesn't always do me justice sometimes. <laughs> Uh, Murray Moore was another one. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay at the Child Guidance Clinic uh, when you returned from McGill? I stayed there until the end of 1954. And uh, the uh, Society of a Couple of Children had just, it was just started. And, uh, the executive director was an old roommate of mine, and I used to help him voluntarily. And uh, he kept bugging me to join him. Um, I enjoyed the work I was doing. I thought it was worthwhile. And I had no intention of, of thinking about leaving. And I finally, to um, put things into an end, I gave him a letter with uh, certain conditions on it that I thought that no sane board would accept, and they, they did. <laughs> and so I had a new job, and uh, I think there were six or seven staff members on the board, uh, on the agency at that time. Mm -hmm. And that was just in the middle of the, or just coming to an end of the polio epidemic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so there was 24-hour jobs there the next couple of years. What position did you go to uh, at the I society? I went in as director of services. And what did that job entail? Uh, that was responsible for the whole program <coughs> of what the society did. Mm -hmm. The executive director sort of took the public relations and fundraising and this sort of thing, mm -hmm. and I took the other part. Mm -hmm. Could you describe uh, um, a bit the, the situation of the physically handicapped uh, in Manitoba at that time? Um, who were you dealing with? Uh, what services were available? Um, who had access to them? That sort of thing. There really weren't any official services. Um, if you had enough money, you could go down to the states and get some treatment. Uh, there was a feeling that the only good services were medical and that uh, all the good doctors were in the States. And uh, this was very expensive and uh, nobody knew who the handicapped were. Uh, having come up through the 30s and 40s, if you were disabled, well, that was just something you had to accept. Uh, nothing was expected of the disabled. I think this is a philosophy that probably came from uh, TB. If you had TB, uh, there was nothing expected of you. Your treatment was long, slow, and even when you were uh, discharged in the sanatorium, you very often, you know, you weren't expected to work. You had TB. You couldn't work. And so, if Aunt Jessie uh, came out, uh, she uh, sort of lived with the different members of the family, and she got excellent care. Nothing was expected of her. She got good care, and she outlived a bunch. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. But she never worked. And that that um, I think that philosophy sort of carried over to the disabled people. And with, with the polio epidemic that occurred in, in, in the late 40s and the early 50s, 
did that attitude change when there became so many more physically handicapped people visible? Yes, that certainly did change. And uh, there were some people of all ages, of course, and there were some young people that were working. There were some young people that were coming out of school. There were some young um, mothers and fathers that had to take their place back in the family. And uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> we were able to prove that there are things they could do and there are things they could uh, make a living at and, or they could look after themselves and make a better home, a better life for themselves. Mm -hmm. So if they had uh, their self-confidence and their self-respect restored, there's uh, really no limit to what they can do. Mm -hmm. Just refer to this picture on the wall here, which was painted by a quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. So today, in 1984, you have the physically disabled, uh, some of them very severe, to having very responsible jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, you mentioned uh, uh, persuading people that the physically handicapped could do more. Did you have a tough time um, persuading people that that was the case? Well, <clears throat> it wasn't uh, a matter of getting up on your on your stool and lecturing. Uh, the best thing to do is just demonstrate that it could be done. Mm -hmm. And they sold themselves, and the physically disabled did a lot for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They could demonstrate what you could do, what they could do. Mm -hmm. And they took, it took a while for the schools and for the the universities and the community colleges and the commercial colleges and the employers mm -hmm. to understand and there's still a long piece to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at that time, what kind of, uh, what kind of government involvement was there in, in providing for the physically handicapped? Well, the, it started off with just children, a society for crippled children, and there was a small grant from the Department of Maternity Care. It was very nominal. And uh, as the society started and started working with the government and started demonstrating what could be done, um, the, uh, the maternity and child care started making more referrals, which meant uh, you had to have the money to, to carry out what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so that started increasing. Then, during the um, polio epidemic uh, aftermath, where you started training these people and demonstrated it could be done with uh, careful guidance and locations, mm -hmm. and uh, and placing them in positions which was possible to do, mm -hmm. uh, and the successes that the agency was having, there was a royal commission appointed to. Um, investigate the rehabilitation services in the province. Mm -hmm. As a result of this, the uh, society was asked to carry out the services for the physically disabled, not just polio adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the government uh, would buy the services they would supply. Mm -hmm. And so that you had for the first time the uh, voluntary and the government working under one administration. Mm -hmm. And you got the best of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got the use of, you got the help of all the volunteers and and, and the government too, the mm -hmm. public and private. Mm -hmm. There are uh, maybe three kinds of or, or three reasons for which people are physically disabled: a um, congenital a birth defect, uh, something uh, a, a physical defect that. Um, comes about because of uh, a war injury or a disability that comes about because of an illness or accident generated um, uh, event. Were you dealing with people from all three of those? Yes. <clears throat> and uh, uh, you work with what, the, uh, what is left, not born, because what is taken away. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, could you <clears throat> explain that to me? I don't quite understand that. Well, I think the symbol of the um, March of Dimes, which is now called the Ability Fund, there's a tree with one branch missing. Uh -huh. And so uh, you don't uh, dwell on what is missing, you dwell on what is left. And so that you build up confidence and self-respect and self-confidence and, uh, and uh, help uh, 
urge and make use of the services. Mm -hmm. And uh, the disability doesn't seem to really matter. It's the, it's the attitude, it's the uh, will to do that's important. Mm -hmm. This is where casework comes in very strongly mm -hmm. to help uh, uh, in the matter of attitude of the, not, only the, not only the disabled person, but the, the uh, family, the community, the employers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, whether it's uh, congenital or whether it's caused by some other reason, um, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. It's a slight advantage if a person has had a good job and uh, knows how to work. Men has had the accident, you have that advantage of them knowing mm -hmm. how to work. Mm -hmm. uh, congenital, you have to train this into the program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I wonder if then perhaps that would be a good place to stop for the moment and we can continue on with your career um, after a few minutes break. Fine. Or, should we stop? Fine. Great. Have we got a cup of coffee, Allison? Mm We're resuming our interview with Archie Carmichael, uh, and I want to correct the date. Uh, the date today is the 24th of January, 1984. Uh, though the date has changed, we're still in Winnipeg. Um, Archie, as we left off the uh, first half of this session, we were discussing uh, the situation that the physically disabled people were in at the time. Perhaps it would be helpful to also have an understanding of, of who was providing what kinds of services and, and how they were relating to each other. Could you describe that? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, when I um, uh, came into the society, it was uh, very much medical because of the polio, polio epidemic. And um, so that uh, you were spending days at clinics and uh, the uh, society staff uh, which we tried not to duplicate uh, any other service that was going on. We would rather complement them, for example. And instead of having physiotherapists on our staff, we brought out uh, some 20-some physiotherapists to work in the Mrs. Elizabeth uh, Hospital mm -hmm. and, and brought the first physical medicine specialist into Winnipeg. But um, <coughs> it was medically oriented. And uh, what kind of staff was the question that we needed? We first of all, concentrated on nurses, which were excellent. Uh, they knew the doctors, they knew the hospitals. But uh, when they were discharged, they were not too well acquainted with the educational system or the vocational field. Then we tried some teachers uh, who were very well acquainted with the educational system, but they were hopeless when they came to the hospital and clinic part of it. So we started uh, trying some social workers, and I guess I was a bit biased, but uh, we found that uh, the social workers uh, could be um, required the least supervision to get started. They could deal with the doctors and the nurses and the hospitals and the teachers and so on on a, another professional level mm -hmm. uh, that complemented all around. And uh, so that from then on we sort of concentrated on social workers, which introduced a model that was accepted across Canada and as well as many other countries. So that we we're proud of Manitoba's contribution to social work and rehabilitation. Indeed. And what was particularly different about what you were doing then? Was it the fact that you were using social workers? Uh, uh, we were using social workers uh, as the responsible for the um, rehabilitation process that this particular patient or client required. And so this meant that the client, for example, might not be turning up for appointments in physio or they might not be turning up for classes at school or, uh, or technical training courses. Why? Uh, or do they not like the instructor or 
Was there something at home that was holding them back, or just what was it? They lose their self-confidence. And so this is where you could zero in. The social worker could be very effective in zeroing and solving the problem so that they could make use of the of the services that were available to them, make use of the opportunities that they had. Uh -huh. And uh, later on, with the, even with the uh, with the employers, but we soon found out that uh, this is one part that social workers didn't do very well of working with employers because they were not business people. Uh -huh. And so then we had to add to our staff um, employment counselors to supplement what the federal government was doing in manpower. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm -hmm. So the social workers, then, were they acting as uh, case managers or yes. case coordinators? Yes. And how would they deal, for example, with the, the medical aspect of rehabilitation, uh, the social aspect, and the vocational aspect? Well, for example, if they, uh, there was certain prescribed um, treatment in the medical part of it, the social worker was responsible to see that it was carried out. And if it wasn't being carried out, or it wasn't understood, they'd bring the client back to the doctor and clarify it. If they were having difficulty themselves, or if it was a school, they'd get the school and the and the clients and the family together, clarify it. Or sometimes it could be done simply by an interview. Mm -hmm. But casework cut down a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was only guidance that was required. An odd time it was just information, but uh, usually it was required some casework that attitudes were uh, a problem or mm -hmm. some feelings that uh, just had to be worked through. Mm -hmm. And uh, from looking at it from the point of view of uh, uh, the profession, and uh, what kind of caseloads, for example, would these people be dealing with the social workers? Well, when we first started, and we had a flood of um, of clients, and uh, you must remember that for a while after the war, there weren't people, and so the caseloads were very heavy. They were up sometimes as high as two and three hundred, mm -hmm. which we got down to under a hundred eventually. Mm -hmm. And some of them required a lot of time; others required just an occasional check mm -hmm. once a year or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was still pretty heavy. <clears throat> so that would have been in the, in the um, period 1945 to 1950, 52 or so, when people like you mm. were going to school and, and becoming social workers. Social yes. workers. Uh -huh. I had the advantage of uh, taking social work training after I had a lot of life experience, too, which helped. Mm -hmm. How did that help you, do you think? Well, I was probably more mature. I had been batted around a bit in life and uh, uh, could uh, sort of empathize, I guess, with, uh, yeah. with some of the problems people were having. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, uh, You're, you were working at that time at the uh, uh, Society for Crippled Children and Adults as, I believe you told me, it was the uh, Director of Service. Service, yes. Did you continue on in that position uh, for quite a while? Uh, until 1960, and uh, unfortunately the Executive Director was very ill and died. And uh, I think there's nobody else to, to take his place. That's why I was appointed as executive director. <laughs> 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 and so I found myself um, uh, not using my social work training, clinical training, uh, very much. I was always uh, found myself in supervision or administration. which I, uh, I found of necessity had to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Had you had specific training for administration? And you were running an agency, which I think was growing. Yes. Um, oh, you grew with it. And uh, I had some short courses on administration. Do had to do a lot of self-study. And uh, there wasn't any such faculty at that time either mm -hmm. in the university. Well, there might have been in some of the universities. It, it wasn't. Uh, it was a faculty of commerce here. Mm -hmm. That was the closest to it. Mm -hmm. Did you get advice or, or support or uh, uh, help uh, in learning how to 
take on these new tasks? Uh, well, I was, I was fortunate to have um, an excellent board of directors, and uh, I was ex uh, also fortunate to get good staff. Mm -hmm. I knew what I couldn't do, and uh, I was able to go out and find the people that could do it for me. And um, that was uh, very helpful. And I had the, more or less the general supervision and coordination of the agency. And uh, these other people uh, did their thing in their own field, whether it was psychology or therapy or nursery teaching or social work, what it was. You were with the agency for a considerable, considerable period of time. What kinds of changes took place in the agency over the number of years that you were there? Well, we found uh, a lot of loopholes, uh, or gaps, I should say, in services that weren't available in the community. And uh, we tried to uh, have agencies uh, that were established develop them. Uh, for example, there were some children that uh, couldn't get to school had learning disabilities and so on. And uh, we uh, filled the gap with the nursery school part of it, the preschool part of it, and uh, tried to get more emphasis on special education in the schools. And that went through a phase where everything was special education for a while, and that sort of leveled off now, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, but our uh, feeling was that we should not run a school, that people in education can run an educational program better than we could. Um, we don't run a hospital. People that run hospitals can do it better than we can. We didn't want to run a transportation system. Uh, Winnipeg Transit probably do it better than we can, but there were times when we had to do it because they weren't equipped and we had to demonstrate and we had to persuade. And and then show them that it was necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these things have come about. And uh, I think Winnipeg is sort of a model in Canada for the size of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand that the, the model that you uh, developed at the agency has uh, been an example not only in Canada but around the world. Well, many countries have adopted the attitude of the case management by social workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, went down to Colombia when I retired to an agency down there in Bogota, Colombia, where they had, uh, uh, were establishing a program and uh, were using one social worker in uh, quite a large agency. And, uh, uh, we're using psychologists and doctors without much coordination. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we illustrated or tried to point out uh, what the advantages might be of using more social workers doing a lot of prevention mm -hmm. and a lot of um, making use of the hospital services rather than do it themselves and uh, using other agency psychologists that were already established uh, starting up a new system. Mm -hmm. And uh, they followed many of these recommendations and they're sending one of their staff up here for training next this spring. Mm -hmm. And uh, the theory is that I'm going to go back again mm -hmm. maybe next year. <laughs> and give them some further consultation? And yes, and uh, any problems that they're having. Mm -hmm. As well as that unique aspect um, of the services that uh, uh, came about through um, the Society for Crippled Children and Adults, uh, was there some unique way uh, in which you worked with other agencies which serve the disabled? Well, uh, there was an opportunity uh, in the late 50s uh, through the Canadian Conference on Children. Uh, we were uh, dreamers at that point of thinking we could send up uh, something similar to the White House Conference on Children that happens every 10 years. So we uh, got ready for our first one in 1960. We had a couple of years to get ready for it. And uh, I was appointed the chairman of Manitoba. And 
we were to survey the services for children, not necessarily disabled children, but children. And so you had the social workers, the psychologists, the teachers, the nurses, the lawyers, the music teachers, the librarians, the artists, and so on, all of which thought they had an edge on children. They really believed it, but they didn't know one another. Uh -huh. And we started making, getting them acquainted, and uh, it was a very exciting uh, few years to bring them together and see the interests that they had and learning from each other, uh -huh. which also helped the agency, of course, in appreciating sure. the problems of disabled people. Sure. And uh, how did it come about that the, uh, the agencies uh, here in Winnipeg, um, do I understand that they're all under one roof? Uh, the Canadian Paraplegic Association, for example, and, and some others that serve the handicap? They started off uh, 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 using the same fundraising aspects. Uh -huh. The Paraplegic Association is a Canadian association, but uh, the funding in Manitoba, they, well, Manitoba, first of all, uh, was the first province to combine Easter Seals for children, March of Dimes for adults. All other provinces were very, very separate, and they're very separate in the states. Mm -hmm. um, there's four other provinces in Canada now that have the combination. Um, then, um, when the provincial government asked the agency to take over adult vocational rehabilitation, other than polio, that meant that you had everything under one administration. And the Paraplegic Association was, uh, for many years, sort of more or less considered a department of, of uh, the whole program. A of, department of the society? Of physically disabled people. Mm -hmm. They maintained their identity. And as they developed, and as the agencies developed, and as the Canadian Paraplegic has developed, they're becoming more independent all the time, mm -hmm. which uh, has its advantages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then how, how has the provincial government and the federal government been involved in services to the disabled over the years? Well, um, there are many, uh, uh, our help came from the federal government through the provincial government, mm -hmm. much of it on a matching basis. Uh, and where there was no funds, uh, we could uh, fill it in with uh, voluntary funds to make it a complete program. Mm -hmm. uh, you get the ridiculous uh, situation sometimes where you could hire teachers out of the government funds and provide all the equipment and space and so on, but you didn't have any bus to get them there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but together, you could make, make a program. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was working very well. And during the time that I was uh, with the society, I worked with all the political parties that were in power during the, gov in the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's positives in them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the, uh, I believe it was in the early 60s, uh, some new federal cost sharing legislation came into effect, the Vocational Rehabilitation for Disabled Persons Act. Did that make a difference in how you could get funding for your clients and for your services? Yes, it did. It was a great help. The uh, province, in the meantime, had been helping out, and we've been helping out with uh, voluntary funds, but the sharing certainly did help. Mm -hmm. And uh, it meant that by that time we were getting more referrals. It, it takes a while to have the general public aware of what you're doing. And uh, we did a lot of public speaking and so on throughout the health units and the regional welfare offices and so on, mm -hmm. but they kept changing. And particularly after the war, there was a tremendous amount of change in personnel. Mm -hmm. You had to do this over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And again, even though they, the main office in the city was stable and they agreed and were cooperative, you had to go back out the grassroots to to explain. <laughs> and say it again. You say it and again. And say it again, yes, yes. <clears throat> During the time uh, that you were at the society, from which was from what 1954 to 1981, was it? Yes. Um, in other uh, fields of service, there was quite a development of consumer groups. Yes. Uh, 
clients who would organize and uh, uh, try to meet some of their own needs. Could you describe what happened in that area in Manitoba? Yes, well, um, as I mentioned earlier, our uh, philosophy, our aim is, was to make, help these people to be as self-confident and as independent as possible. If those two qualities are met, there's really no limit in what they might be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, when you're there for nearly 30 years, you're going to see some of the children pass right through to being parents themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, their level of expectation is going to raise and on a higher level. And so they're not going to be satisfied with the old standards that you have. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to um, express their views, which is quite normal. And uh, <coughs> some of them did, some of them were very vocal, some of them went on our board. Some of them were very aggressive and wanted to have more control. Mm -hmm. And this process is still being worked out. Um, the, uh, um, there was an organization formed here in, the, in Manitoba. And there was a, to begin with, there was a federal government made it possible for um, the consumers to have a conference in Toronto, and the agency uh, paid their transportation down. The federal government paid their hotel while they were there. Um, the Manitoba delegates come back; they're very passive because they seem to think they're much better off in the other place, and we had to really push them to to uh, keep the organization going here. Mm -hmm. But once it took off, it was. Uh, very good. But then uh, they formed a Canadian organization later on, and it was the president was a Manitoba person. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had the World Congress in Rehabilitation here in 1980, mm -hmm. and uh, there was uh, uh, quite a bit of participation by the, the consumers. Mm -hmm. And there was a World Committee formed, and the chairman of that was a Manitoba person. Who are those people that you're mentioning? The the, the Manitoba chairman for the Canadian uh, group uh, uh, is that is that uh, COPO, the Council of Provincial yes. Organizations for the Handicapped? Yes. Um, is it uh, Jim Dirksen? Uh, well, Jim probably is now. Before that was Alan Simpson. Alan Simpson was the original leader. Jim Dirksen has become uh, very vocal since. Mm -hmm. um, Henry Enns became the, uh, the chairman of the uh, World Committee. Mm -hmm. And he's a Manitoban? Yes. So I think that probably we succeeded. <laughs> <coughs> but mm -hmm. uh, uh, even though you succeed, sometimes you don't always satisfy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it depends on what your goal was, I guess, in yeah. helping that group get going. And so that uh, now there's a process, uh, going through a process of of uh, reevaluating what the agency should be doing, the board is much more, uh, many more uh, consumers on the board than ever before, mm -hmm. and it's pretty well a new board. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, they got a new executive director too. Yes, <laughs> yes, since you've retired. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. You mentioned uh, the the uh, World Congress on the Disabled, which was held uh, uh, here in Winnipeg in 1980. Mm -hmm. How were you involved in uh, that taking place? Well, um, my board um, always was very liberal in allowing me to uh, visit other places, other cities, uh, not only in Canada, but also the States. Uh, Minneapolis is a good source of experience. But uh, I uh, was able to attend World Congresses in different parts of the world. I think the first one was New York, and then we went to Denmark, and Dublin, <coughs> Dublin, Sydney, Australia, Tel Aviv. And it happened every four years. And uh, you do become very involved. You do become acquainted with people because the there's a chorus, same people 
and your correspondence is very easy with them. Mm -hmm. And when you want conferences, it's very easy to get speakers and participants as they travel in different countries. You know when they're coming, and you use them. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, at Tel Aviv in 1976, uh, we made a bid for come to Winnipeg for 1980. And I think we had to compete against Austria and Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an amusing thing happened, uh, uh, we uh, were to make a booth, a display, and uh, to make sure it got there, we sent it through the diplomatic uh, federal offices. Mm -hmm. And uh, I carried a little case like this one here from the convention center here at the last minute. And uh, once we got there, we found that nothing had arrived from Ottawa. All that we had was this little case on the Winnipeg <laughs> Convention Center. And we dashed across the street to the Canadian Embassy for some help. And all they had was beautiful scenery of the Rockies and so on of Canada. So we made the best we could and set up this machine, which projected a, a picture and uh, had uh, uh, oral recording along with it. And we thought we th had thought of everything, but for, for, we forgot about the Ambridge. And so when it came on, it was mm, 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 <laughs> and very slow. And then we noticed <laughs> our booth was just crowded with people, and we wondered what on earth for. And uh, so they thought it was very thoughtful of the Canadians to have something that was slow enough in English that they could all understand. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was one of the most popular booths. <laughs> uh, it worked out well then. Yes. <laughs> That's marvelous. That's and marvelous. So our other equipment never did arrive. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a number of commissions of the World Congress that meet to on social aspects, administration, medical, vocational, so on. Mm -hmm. So we had one administration and one on social aspects that met the week before here, which we were responsible for two, for uh, hosting two. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> we had the School of Social Work, or the uh, MASW help us with the uh, social aspects. Mm -hmm. And we had the Institute of Association Executives help us with the administration part of it. Mm -hmm. and we came together to meet, mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, it worked out very well. Uh, that event, um, the event of the World Congress uh, in Winnipeg in 1980, I think was a pretty significant achievement for, for you and for the association. Yes, it's, um, <clears throat> the, it was the largest um, Congress they've ever had. Uh, uh -huh. the, the one, there's another one this year, this thing, every four years, 1984 mm -hmm. in Portugal. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, it was uh, there was over four thousand registered people. Yes. And, yes. Uh, the city of Winnipeg would have been pleased about that as well. Yes, I suppose. and th this helped us too to uh, overcome a lot of the architectural barriers, the curbing and the ramps and the elevators in the airport and this sort of thing. And that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had the World Congress here. <laughs> so y you were aware of these architectural barriers ahead of time and were able to. Mm -hmm. Persuade someone we to change. We had a person on staff that did nothing else. He was disabled himself, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, Mental Association for the Disabled People, of the disabled people, uh, um, also were very cooperative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, a moment ago the uh, Manitoba Association of Social Workers. I wonder if we could turn now to your your involvement with the professional association over the years. Um, I, when did you get started uh, with uh, professional, the Professional Social Work Association? Well, I became a member of the Professional Association as a student. Uh, I sometimes wondered since then whether I was a social worker or not because of my involvement in, in uh, many aspects of rehabilitation and even the Child Guidance Clinic. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, I did serve my stint, I suppose, in the, on the board of the local, or Manitoba Association. I was on the CSW for two terms, mm -hmm. four-year terms. Um, 
were also one of the highlights there. I remember back in the 50s when salaries were very low, uh, being involved as a co-chairman of a committee on salaries. And uh, much to our surprise, we drew up what we thought was fair salary. It was more than the province was offering, but uh, we went undertook to go out and talk to agencies to sell it. It's all the idea, and we didn't have any opposition. <laughs> that was a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, particularly when you're talking about money. Um, one of the events that uh, occurred during uh, your would have been your early career here um, was the threatened closure of the School of Social Work uh, here uh, in about 1952. Were you at all involved or affected by that issue? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, uh, we, we had very good leadership here with Ab Dillon and, uh, and uh, Helen Mann, some of these people. Uh, they're, they're, I'm not a, I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> uh, they did a very good job, and uh, uh, there was uh, involvement in work in committees and so on. Mm -hmm. It would have affected us a great deal. I, was, I felt very strongly about it because I could see what social workers could contribute to mm -hmm. child guidance clinic and the society of rehabilitation, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it would have been drastic to have lost the school. Why was there a, a threat of closing the school? Well, I think it was uh, budget. And they were going to cut down on something, and the social work uh, was new and it didn't have much priority, mm -hmm. and it didn't have as much uh, credibility as it has today. Mm -hmm. And it was just sort of on the verge, and we had to fight for it. Mm -hmm. That is this good. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you, you you were successful. The school mm -hmm. didn't didn't mm -hmm. close. That's right. Was the professional association uh, at all involved in uh, in the issues that you were uh, working on in your paid employment? Uh, I don't know how to answer that. They were certainly sympathetic and supportive. Uh, I was wondering whether they were involved in uh, helping you lobby for uh, one cause or another, or help you do some research that would have uh, been persuasive, uh, any of that kind of thing? Well, they certainly didn't uh, object to what we were doing. Um, the Social Planning Council did some studies for us and some research. Uh, we were always involved back and forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, we didn't make a big, big issue of anything particular. Mm -hmm. We all always had a unit of social work uh, students. Mm -hmm. I personally thought that uh, it was an ideal place to train a social work student because they had to, at least they had exposure to so many other professional professions, mm -hmm. um, the doctors and teachers and the therapists and so on. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, I thought it gave, it broadened your view of social work. Yes, yeah, indeed it would. Um, I'd like to move now to some, some more general questions um, um, about what's happened since your retirement, uh, what, you're, what you've been involved in then, what you're doing now. Um, um, well, um, I was thinking of going back to work to have a rest. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this myth of uh, having nothing to do when you retire is uh, a myth. <laughs> uh, shortly after I retired, I uh, was in, in connection with the Canadian Executive Service overseas mm -hmm. through the uh, request that came in from Rehabilitation International New York for some assistance and. Uh, uh, Rehabilitation Foundation in Bogota, Colombia, and uh, so we went down 
my wife and I went down from March until June in 1882. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, did things just the opposite of what we had been accustomed to doing here. We did a lot of practice in social and uh, rehabilitation here and finally developed services and finally got a building to work out of. Mm -hmm. uh, Columbia got the building first and they didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, they had no experience in actually uh, doing rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they uh, were re very receptive to suggestions and very interested. Mm -hmm. They gave us uh, very good, were very good hosts to us as well as, as uh, um, well, it was very good to us. They took us into their homes, and uh, it wasn't a weekend when we were there that we weren't taken somewhere. Uh -huh. We saw a lot of the country around, and, uh -huh. and then we had a surprise visit last November when the president and one of the staff members were attending a conference in the United States, and they came up to Winnipeg for a few days. Mm -hmm. This was the president of the uh, of the foundation. The foundation in mm -hmm. Columbia. Mm -hmm. He's in a wheelchair. He was a an athlete in in uh, football, rugby, mm -hmm. and was injured. And uh, so he's the president. Mm -hmm. A very good fellow. He's a professional accountant. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, the way they started was that they uh, they could raise money through a popular talk show on television but to go to France or Germany or China, Japan to play basketball. But then they commenced to feel that there were many uh, disabled people that were not athletes mm -hmm. and that they should be doing something to help them too. Mm -hmm. So with that thought, that was how the foundation started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and moved on from there. So that was a little bit different than why it started here. Yes, indeed. Um, as well as your involvement with the uh, Canadian Executive Service overseas, uh, have you been involved in other volunteer activities for the last couple of years? Well, the uh, Canadian Executive Service overseas also has a Canadian program with the Native Indians mm -hmm. in Canada. And so I've continued with them with the Indians in the core area of Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. And I've been working with two or three organizations rather not not the individuals but the organizations mm -hmm. and it's strictly a volunteer advisory sort of job it's very interesting and does this have are you dealing with um, organizations for the disabled uh, no no it's just uh, organizations of the native of the Indian people the Indian arts and crafts for example are holding mm -hmm. a big art a big trade show a Canadian trade show here in, in February mm-hmm Mm -hmm. and an organization of urban Indians association who have um, are made up of people that have left the reserve and come into Winnipeg mm -hmm. and no longer live on the reserve mm -hmm. and there's very little for them mm -hmm. so they're batting together to help themselves. Mm -hmm. So you're able to use your skills in organizing and, and uh, teaching and motivating uh, to assist the hopefully to consult with these groups. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, there's, mm -hmm. there's also another. Uh, I do a lot of work through Rotary, through the International Committee. We are sending a bus uh, to Colombia, for example, mm -hmm. to get into these uh, trails in the mountains to reach uh, a four-wheel drive vehicle mm -hmm. to reach the people that can't, where there are no roads or no cars can't get. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's one project. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, another project is with the, the Senior Bureau of the Chamber of Commerce, which uh, has a monthly program of ex-members of the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I'm involved with the <laughs> committee selecting uh, um, good citizen awards. The, uh, we have facing us right now 59 recommendations of which has to be reduced to six 
which is very difficult. They're all very good recommendations. They're all very good people. <laughs> so that'll be quite a process to go mm -hmm. through then to choose. So the there's, there's plenty of things to do. Yes, and it sounds as though you're involved in many of them. Um, perhaps we could move now to a, a little uh, broader perspective. And uh, I'm wondering, as, as you look back on your involvement with the, with the physical, physically disabled, what would you say are the most significant, develop, de significant developments that have happened f for that group of people over the years that you've uh, been involved? I, I think that uh, is it able to, uh, many of them to come out and be productive citizens and uh, uh, taxpayers and all the rest of it, uh, they really become part of the community. Mm -hmm and that uh, the community has responded slowly, but they've responded by making uh, uh, buildings and uh, transportation accessible to them, even in wheelchairs. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's certainly a big improvement. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's very few, uh, well, uh, there aren't any new uh, crosswalk, or at least uh, curbs in Winnipeg now that are being built without a cut curb. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Bogota, a city of six million people, there's one. Mm -hmm. And it's a hilly city. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, there's no wheelchairs uh, except poor quality. And then the imports are, have a luxury tax on them. So there's a great ways to go mm -hmm. Indeed. in there. Indeed. Uh, so. <clears throat> Again, regarding the, the uh, physically disabled here in, in Manitoba and in Canada generally, what, what would you say needs to be done? What is there left to be done, uh, regardless of the developments that have happened so far? Well, there's still a big problem in attitudes. There's still a big problem in, in uh, having the disabled themselves uh, have more control over what's happening. Um, I doubt if they uh, should have complete control because uh, it's a community effort. It's not just a segregated. They, you don't want them. To, they don't want it, and mm -hmm. we don't want it. Anybody else doesn't want them to be segregated separately. It's a community, it's a total community. Mm -hmm. So that the board of directors and so on should be representative of the total community. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, that has to be developed further. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's many professions, too, that they haven't got into yet that they can. Um, they're certainly in a great number. Um, Which ones do you have in mind? Huh? Well, yeah. take medicine, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. No reason why a disabled person in a wheelchair can't be a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a with the accessibility of buildings and transportation, streets and so on, uh, that shouldn't be a problem in any profession, mm -hmm. except uh, maybe climbing the walls or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So attitudes and accessibility, both physical accessibility and accessibility to work, mm -hmm. still remains bar uh, to yes. be barriers. And there's uh, employment uh, attitudes too have to be improved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who do you see as being uh, res responsible for these changes that need to take place? Oh, I think we're all responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the handicapped themselves are, uh, have some responsibility, but not all of it. Uh, we're all responsible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, in, any institution, the medical, the educational, the uh, employment, mm -hmm. they all have a share in it. As we're moving toward a, toward a close now, Mr. Carmichael, I wonder if there's any uh, advice or, or suggestions you'd give to people who are practicing social work now or people who are students now. Anything you think they should pay particular attention to? Well, I, uh, I'm always a little worried about social, work, uh, social workers uh, looking at their profession too narrowly. <laughs> uh, I think they should uh, broaden their vision a little bit and uh, apply their 
skills and uh, in social work on a broader basis uh, as a part of the community. Um, there's a danger of this when you're in an agency where you just do clinical work. You get very tied down, you get very protected environment which uh, scares them to change mm -hmm. and we must change. Mm -hmm. and I think the uh, training they're getting today is uh, much better than what we got. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's going to improve too. Mm -hmm. uh, even the training possibilities are being widened to make it more accessible to more people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, any last words you'd like to uh, to share with us? Uh, well, I don't know. I think it's a very good pr career, very good profession. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no regrets at all. Of having gone through it, I've had many satisfactions mm -hmm. and a few disappointments. But uh, it's the good things you remember. Something uh -huh. like being a prisoner of war. You all the horrible things that happened. You. They seem to be unreal now. It's just the, the fun things that you remember. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Carmichael, you're, you're uh, an optimist and a very uh, pleasant and inspiring mm. person to be with. I want to thank you very much for taking uh, time to uh, talk, with, uh, talk with me this morning and uh, for sharing these recollections with all mm. of us. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. <laughs>
This ox cart has become a trademark of our Farm and Preparation Center, formerly the Industrial Workshop of the Society of Equipment Children and Adults. The ox the cart has become very popular right across the country, and you'll find it in gift shops and airports and jewelry stores, even department stores and so on. And um, incidentally, the, my Rotary Club uh, presents uh, one of these ox carts to the visitor that comes from the furthest distance each week. So they have the ox carts. And for the disabled, which is uh, followed by, uh, from the ex-executive uh, director, Keith S. Armstrong, for an award made to staff who have contributed to the field of rehabilitation. This was presented in Calgary at a Canadian annual, annual meeting. This uh, was a surprise when I returned from um, work in Columbia after my retirement from the University of Winnipeg uh, asked me if I would accept the honorary degree of Dr. Bloss, which was a very nice gesture for having done something that I should have been doing all my life anyway. The award that's uh, presented through the uh, Tourism Association Manitoba and uh, presented by the Lieutenant Governor Earl McConnell. Presented to me by the Board of Directors on my retirement. As, uh, this is the Society for Couple Children building behind us.